Let me start by asking you two questions. How many of you in the room are actually economists? All right, quite a couple. And how many of you in the room think that um, the economic theory and the, uh, uh, is actually feasible enough to solve our ecological and social um, problems at this moment? Well, there's not one hand going up. Well, I'm an economist as well, and I would even call myself a hopeless economist um, that does believe that there is a solution to that, that there must be an economic system that serves the need of all human beings on this planet, taking into account finite resources. How do we get there? Well, let me take you on my personal journey. I studied uh, economics in the years 1988 to 1992, and I'm very fortunate that I did that at that time because it was surrounded by two major events. First was the publication of the Brundtland Report called Our Common Future. And this report, for the first time, really gave us a good definition of what sustainable development is. It says it's a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I was really fascinated by that vision, and I thought, you know, that's a good vision for an economic system as well. And by the end of my studies, we saw the first Earth uh, Conference, uh, the, the Rio Conference, the Earth Summit. And even the, uh, the principle one of the Earth Summit declaration was telling us that human beings are at the center of concern for sustainable development. They are en uh, entitled to have a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. Why am I mentioning these two quotes at this moment? Because I want to remind all of you that it's all about human beings here. And when people nowadays say, hey, we need to save the planet, I would normally say, no, we need to save ourselves on this planet, and by that, save the planet. And if we look at economic theory so far, and look at it from the perspective of sustainable development, uh, I can only say it's a story of uh, devastating disconnects. And I'm not going to talk about the abuse of Adam Smith's um, in, in invisible hands of the market, or uh, the idea of this strange person called Homo economicus, or um, about the fact that we see GDP and economic value added as the most important measures of success. I don't want to talk about so, uh, so much about negative things, because there, there's a lot that has happened since the Earth Summit in 1992. We have seen the coming of the Global Reporting Initiative. We see thousands of sustainability reports being published every year. We see the UN Global Compact. We see the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We see rating and, rate, uh, and, and ranking systems coming up, like the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, like the Carbon Disclosure Project, a lot of specialized initiatives, like the Global Footprint Network, the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises, the ISO, uh, International Standardization Organization, um, and many, many more. And we've also seen um, the coming of the Internet and you know, the value that the internet uh, has for us who deal with sustainable development, the awareness raising, the community building, and even taking some of the existing old business models um, and, you know, just, uh, and just being a risk for them. So the question after 20 years is really, have we achieved enough? And the answer, unfortunately, is by far not. Um, here are two quotes that I wanted to mention. First is one from the UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon, who said, our current economic model is a global suicide pact. We mined our way to growth, we burned our way to prosperity, we believed in consumption without consequences. But those days are gone. And then one year ago, in the advent of the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference, it was the Club of Rome who already produced um, the, the groundbreaking 1972 re report, um, Limits to Growth, that came up with a future study looking again in, uh, at the next 40 years. And what they were saying is uh, in that uh, report that um, there is a possibility that humankind might not survive on the planet if it continues on its path of overconsumption and short-termism. So to be crystal clear to everyone in the room, we as the human beings with the current economic system and theory are on a slow death path. So what, ne what needs to happen then? I think we need to understand that there's another big shift in front of us. So we have to 
just accept, you know, we are now living in what is called the Anthropocene. It was a Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krusen, who uh, coined that term, and he said, you know, we as human beings have become managers of planet Earth, of planet Earth. If we want it or not, that's a different question. We are. So we need to understand that sustainability and the way that we have used it so far as corporate responsibility has done nothing else than to just keep a sort of a license to operate, and that is already uh, under discussion. The way that we have operationalized it is just very reductive re or re reductionistic. We need to come to a different understanding. And I do call this thriveability. It goes beyond the simple ability to sustain. Is that what we want as people, as humans on this planet? To sustain, to simply survive? I think we look for something way more. You know, we want to thrive as human beings, as individuals, as companies, as parts of the world. So we need to understand that we need to take this concept further. So from sustainability to thriveability as a primary lens for, innov uh, for, for innovation and strategy. And by that, getting a license to grow. Because growth is one of those paradigms that is still mentioned every time and everywhere. But we are somehow stuck in this in this trend transition from this way of dealing with sustainability uh, towards thrivability. So what we need to do is to look at two different issues. First of all, we need to close what I call the sustainability context gap. And I will come to that in a minute. And the second thing that I want us to think of is that we need to shift our emphasis from the pure ability to sustain towards an ability to thrive. So let's look at the sustainability context gap first. So what is it? You know, th this is the, the, the real situation. We have sustainability reports coming from companies. They give us very little about the strategy, the long-term strategy of an organization. And they give us a lot of information, a lot of indicators, but most of them are efficiency-driven, relative indicators. They just look at the past performance. And, you know, the only thing that we as human beings at this moment, if we're interested in these reports, can read is that how much has a company become less bad? Well, we have no single clue what is minimally good enough. And that's a major context gap that we see there. Then also, if we look then at the rankings and the ratings that we have seen so far, you know, these are rankings and ratings that take the existing information. And what you can say is that, um, you know, they, they define best in class, but their methodologies are mostly black boxes. So again, you know, what can I read out of this? Is the best in class minimally good enough to be able to survive or to thrive? I have no clue. We are fishing blindly. Absolutely. And then if you see how companies really operationalize sustainability and have 20 years of experience working with companies, you do see that it's very technocratic, very mechanistically. You know, they use reporting standards, they use management system standards, but they don't have a long-term vision. And by that, they don't give me any information what is their legacy for the long term and uh, their right to exist in the future as well. So if we go from there, if we want to close the sustainability context gap, we need to be aware of one very specific thing, and that is what you read here. What we have done so far when it comes to sustainability, we have only focused on that middle piece. So our sustainability initiatives thus far have focused on improving and transforming support systems in an existing economic paradigm. We haven't been able to change the paradigm condition so far. So there are two gaps here we need to, uh, that we need to close. First of all, we need to close the gap between the meso um, area and the meta area. This is what is called the micro-macro link. You know, the information of how a company is per performing needs to be put in context with macroeconomic uh, perspectives and urgencies. And the other thing, the other gap that we need to close is that we need to make sure that every human being uh, feels excited about, uh, you know, taking care of sustainability or thrivability, if you want. So what we need really is these North Stars. And I want to quote Omar, Omar Bradley, who is a general from the Second World War, who have used this famous phrase that Al Gore has also used in, in, in Inconvenient Truth, where he said, it's time we need to be steered by the stars not by the light of each passing ship. So all these rankings and ratings are all only passing ships. They don't tell us where we have to go to. They don't give us that long-term vision. 
You know, and it just continues that we are flying blind. Those gaps need to be closed. So how do we do this? You know, I'm not saying that we need to give up sustainability, no. I'm saying we need to reclaim what sustainability was in the past. It, you know, and just re remember the definitions from the very beginning. It's about human beings, it's about intergenerational equity, and it's about people, planet, and prosperity, and not just simply about people, planet, and profit. That, red and, uh, that very uh, reduced way of understanding that companies nowadays use it. So we still need sustainability, but we need to com combine it, actually. We need to um, think about how to com combine sustainability and innovation. This is what triggers people quite a lot. We have to think about design. You know, design is about beauty. It's about things that we like, but it's not about designing just only products and services, but also systems and processes in a way that they, that they serve uh, human beings. And finally, we need to take into account what has happened um, in all the research around psychology. We have learned a lot about what is called spiral dynamics, the ability of human beings to actually move up the human consciousness by a couple of levels during their lifetime. We have heard about flourishing. We have heard about, uh, about beneficial leadership. So all of that needs to be combined to, into one single uh, picture in order to make sustainably, uh, a, a sustainable planet and move, it, and move us human beings into an area of thrivability. And all of that, of course, needs leadership. And it also needs strategy. So the situation that we are in at this moment is really, and that's what's described in that curve, is that we are in a sort of a chaotic zone. And we need to move forward. And that is what we want to do with uh, thrivability, really to embed thrivability. So if we now think about you know, how to do that, you know, people are sometimes somehow overwhelmed by the com complexity of all of that that's already happening here. What we want to you know, serve you with is the idea of using thrivability as a new way to simplify that com complexity. We call it simplexity, the other side of complexity. And I want to recommend, and that's the idea we're spreading here, that we just look at, at four different quadrants that we really need to take care of. First of all, we need to look at the, our human journey. We now know about different levels of uh, change and transformation that is needed. We can, there, are, there are test systems out there that we can use. We can use them as individuals, we can use them as corporations, we can even use it for countries if we want. We just need, and that's the, the sort of connection that we need to make with the individual and where, any, where we need to find out where the human level of consciousness is towards thrivability. Then, of course, we need to continue measuring our footprints, that's what we do right now, um, of our lifestyle and our, uh, and our creations. But we also need to actually combine it with the, with the handprints, what we have actually achieved. So not just only reducing the negative impacts, but also increasing the positive impacts, the footprints and the handprints. And we need to put that into, uh, into context, just closing the sustainability context gap. We need to um, find indicators where we put it into context of the carrying capacity of our flourishing world. Again, as an individual, or as an organization, or as a certain region. And finally, what we also need are predictive models. How do we get there? That's what the North Stars are, are, are actually uh, for. So that transformation to a conscious economy needs to be described. All it needs is these four different in ingredients, not more, but also not less. So where are the leaders in this? You know, there's an awful lot already existing. It's not that we start this whole journey from scratch. We just need to synthesize, we just need to pull these things together and just put it into the right context and by that overcoming the individual sustainability context gap and the macroeconomic sustainability context gap and by that um, giving us the ability to really thrive. A lot is already happening, but it's only pieces of that patchwork. So here's one example. That's the newest sustainability report by an organization called Kingfisher in the UK, who say we need to go beyond zero impact to make a positive contribution. They are saying we need to become net positive, and it's the start of a journey for us. They're exactly following this idea of, you know, what is my legacy? What is our long-term uh, right to exist? We have seen the start of what is called the B-team, 
um, Sir Richard Branson, Jochen Seitz from Puma, Paul Pullman from Unilever, just plugging together, pulling together, and say, you know, plan E hasn't worked, uh, plan, plan A hasn't worked, we need plan B. We see the World Business Council that by 2009 came up with a vision 2050, and then just, you know, was asleep at the wheel for a couple of years, and now just simply started to say, okay, if we know what the vision 2050 is, what will have to be our action 2020? So they now become very active around those uh, issues. And they are trying to, you know, build those micro-macro links as well. They are quite busy in that area. And we have seen the circular economy just simply you know, giving us a new economic theory um, of you know, how uh, you know, um, resources need to flow in our current system. Well, how can you actually con contribute to a thriving economic system? Well, first of all, start with yourself and start your own journey, like I started my journey 20 years ago. Accept and advocate that you know, whenever a company is growing or whatever company you want to work for, their growth has to be bound to a net positive impact. If the business model needs to be growth-based, which is a different question. Also, build cross-sectoral adaptation and implementation plans ba based on the idea of North Stars. Plug these four different quadrants together and help us build them. Develop dashboards that are con converting these uh, four quadrants of thrivability into doable action. Support a circular economic system. Support the idea of true costing, true pricing, and true taxation. They are absolutely necessary, and they need to be balanced uh, against each other if we want to have a thriving economic system available for the future. Redesign and broaden accounting rules. Our current accounting rules are in no way prepared for a circular economy. For example, do we need depreciation in an area or in an, in a, in an, in an age where resources keep their value? Redesign education towards thrival. Be sharp in defining what real innovation for thrival has to be. And from, a, from the attitude that I want to bring to you is, it's not about perfection here, it's about you know, a certain level of feasible precision. So, I'm asking you, please go for it, be the change and become thrival. Thank you very much.